And look at you now, a silver fox. I don't recognize myself this way. Everybody, men and women, you know, people in the business are, I think they all seem to have decided to just let it happen. Be natural. Once upon a time, you could never do it. Uh, and yeah. it was totally expected that you kind of clung to that youthful glow. Seriously, it's 2024 now and times have changed and you can just be yourself. And in yeah. so many ways, that's very liberating. Well, you know, uh, I... I kind of have forgotten that my hair is silver, but the only time I notice it is if you go out with friends and someone wants to take a picture, and then you look at it and I think, oh my God, the white hair. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm still in the process of getting used to it, but uh, there it is, there it is, yeah. You look absolutely fantastic. Look, speaking <laughs> of fantastic, 75 years in showbiz, uh, dancer, actor. You began your showbiz life singing in the church choir and you wound up in a Catherine Hepburn movie called Song of Love and that was 1947 and you'd have been around about 15. That choir sang uh, either in or were recorded for quite a few films. And yes. so when I was singing with the choir, we, we, we were hired to be in a, a concert sequence with the symphony orchestra and the whole thing, the choir up in the back. Um, I couldn't believe that I was actually in at MGM. And I didn't know anything at 14, but I actually thought the minute that sound stage door opened and someone came in, they were going to walk, they were going to discover me. Yes. <laughs> and I would be under contract, under stock. Uh, so funny what you think of you know, at that young age, you know. What do you remember about Catherine Hepburn? I, I remember her voice because uh, she has a, a distinctive voice and, and uh, this extraordinary woman, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor was another great star who you got to see on the back lot of MGM. I remember one day we were listening, we went over to one of the sound stages to hear Mario Lanza record and she came alongside and was standing, listening to him, you know, work as well. But she was quiet, just a, a, a darling young woman, you know. That, of course, we all know how beautiful she She got even more beautiful at the time. Now, you were living in Long Beach and a high school friend suggested dance class. Her name was Joan, Joan Scanlon. Uh, but she heard about the American School of Dance, it was called, on Hollywood Boulevard, not far from Grauman's. She had heard that Sid Charisse and Leslie Caron took class there. That's all I had to hear. Uh, <laughs> and I took the train to watch a professional class. Once I saw that, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And uh, mm -hmm. so I worked during the day and I took class at night and I started to, start to meet the other kids at the school who were already working on singing in the rain and things like that. So it was just... It just couldn't have been better. It just couldn't have been better. It was just de a delicious time. Fast forward, and you were one of the dancers in that Marilyn Monroe, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend song from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. The man who choreographed that, that film and that number for Marilyn was Jack Cole. Marilyn loved Jack Cole, and she was right to love him. He, she worked with him a, a number of times in other films as well. So the, the first obligation in, work, in working on that number was, of course, to please Jack Cole. I paid no attention to, to Marilyn Monroe because we were supposed to do what we were supposed to. And uh, she came in a few times uh, to rehearse. She was dressed casually in what they call pedal pushers. Uh, and <laughs> I, I assumed that a lot of her rehearsal, and this is just an assumption, but it makes sense, was done privately so that she didn't have people staring at her while she was trying to learn something. Uh, it took a few weeks to, for Jack Cole to stage that number and it was three days uh, to film up till nine o'clock in the evening on the third night. First of all, what a conscientious and professional worker she was. She was very quiet. She, if, if they yelled cut for any reason, she didn't look in the mirror. She didn't go to check out it. She didn't go over. She went right back to her starting position to start again, just like we did. Uh, and uh, I that's one of the things I remember about her because I thought I thought it was exceptional that she was that concentrated and that concerned and cared that much about her work.
because you hear so many stories about, oh, she's hours late to set, she doesn't turn up when she gets there, she doesn't know her lines, and you noted a conscientious, hardworking, completely dedicated, focused person. Absolutely. You know, again, it took three days, and she was uh, never late. To yeah, by, by the way, you know, in a movie called No Business Like Show Business, I was in the chorus of that too, and and one of the numbers in that is called Lazy that uh, Missy Gaynor and Donald O'Connor did with Marilyn. And one day, she was late. They were there at nine o'clock in the morning. She didn't get there till three. I just remember that one tiny incident. But, but what I've always thought to myself: Listen, she was late, but boy, was she worth waiting for. <laughs> Yes, amazing. Was she as absolutely beautiful up close and personal as we saw her shimmering on the screen? You can't make someone look like she looked on the screen without looking that way. She absolutely was every bit as beautiful in person and, and uh, yeah, she was gorgeous. But but, but I think there were, there were, when we think of Marilyn Monroe, when I think of Marilyn Monroe, I think of much more than just the way she looked. Uh, I think of the special quality that she brought to everything she ever did. I think she was a perfectionist, and I think she really cared deeply, deeply about what she was doing and about her work. The only other person I ever felt uh, that I met who I felt, who I thought felt the same way about their work was Jerome Robbins. He was also a perfectionist. I, but in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think she was too. All these decades on, George, she still fascinates. She still excites. Why do you think that is? Well, I think she remains absolutely contemporary. You know, she, there's nothing about her that is dated. Now, you can be seen dancing in the wedding scene in that movie, Brigadoon, of course, with Gene Kelly and Van Johnson. Do you have memories of making that movie and doing that particular dance routine? I was in a couple of the sequences. One was the uh, big sequence that we were had tons of us all around, so you couldn't see anybody really. Uh, but um, in Brigadoon, there's uh, the sword dance. Gene staged uh, that, that number and... Uh, Doing Scottish dancing and dancing on the balls with your feet for long periods of time, you get horrible shin splints that are really painful. And the only reason I mention it is because Gene took such good care of us. He knew what it was like himself to, to suffer that kind of injury, I'll say. I remember how thoughtful he was. And I, what great care he, he took great care of his dancers. Uh, you did a wonderful movie, Dancing in It, with the great Debbie Reynolds, Give the Girl a Break. The thing I remember about that was um, uh, shooting the, the applause number uh, with Debbie and with Gower Champion. When something, I'll say, went wrong, Debbie would just stop. Her instinct that she was absolutely right, she was afraid some something would go by that she wasn't happy with. And the only way to be sure of that was to not do it. Yeah, very smart move, that absolutely. So that was your kind of journey to stardom, as it were. But it was a dancer in that movie, White Christmas, alongside Rosemary Clooney and Vera Ellen, that really catapulted you to superstardom. The, the previous number, which the, the, the Mandy number, uh, uh, which featured your Ellen dancing in it with Johnny Brasher partnering her, and it featured the other stars of the film in it as well. So the the love you didn't do right by me was Rosie singing that song, and Robert Alton decided to have four of the dancers around her, just four of us. Yes. So since there were just four of us, we we were noticed more. Uh, but uh, in the course of the number, we each got kind of medium shot with Rosie. Uh, and that Christmas, um, Life magazine had a spread on White Christmas with a lot of the photographs, musical numbers from the film. And one of the photos they had was a picture of Rosie with the four of us around her. And by this time, I was working on on, on the Girl Rush. Uh, and the same producer, Robert Emmett Dolan, was the producer of White Christmas and uh, the Girl Rush. And uh, a lot of people <laughs> were... Uh, cutting out the the picture of the four of us around Rosie, and they they wanted to know who I was, 
And Robert uh, Dolan, he uh, thought the studio should to test me and thanks to him, they did. And so again, going from Love You Didn't Do Right by me and the sort of medium shot with Rosie into Robert Emma Dolan, I did test at Paramount. I was under Paramount on the contract pair for a whole year. <laughs> you went from dancing wow. in the movies to suddenly being a star in the now iconic movie musical West Side Story. But it was a musical you knew very well because you'd start a few years earlier in the London production of West Side Story. I, I got to audition for Jerry. He was uh, doing it Ballets USA at the Alvin Theatre in New York. And I was told that I would be reading for the role of Bernardo. And after I finished, he asked me to go back in the wings and look at the role of Riff. So I did that. Um, and then on my birthday, September 16th, 1958, Ruth Mitchell, who was the stage manager for West Side Story, called me to tell me that I'm being hired to play Riff. So it was a great birthday. <laughs> so on the West End, you got to play Riff. Of course, in the Hollywood movie musical, you were Bernardo. Natalie Wood, of course, played your sister Maria. What was Natalie like to work with? She was wonderful to work with. She was very friendly. She was 23 or something, maybe 22. She was so young. But she already was a major star. Uh, and I think uh, the producers uh, felt they needed her for different reasons. One of them was because she was a star and everybody else in the film was unknown. And so they, the insecurity you know, reared its ugly head. And, but, but they were right. Um, Bob Wise tells a wonderful story. He went to uh, look at film on Warren Beatty at Warner Brothers. I think maybe it might have been displayed from the grass. Yes. And, and Bob Wise tells the story. When he saw Natalie, he said, that's our Maria. In that movie, um, Natalie falls for Tony, played by uh, Richard Beamer. Uh, and there were tensions, and you write about this in your book. I know there were stories around that Natalie wanted maybe Robert Wagner to play the role or Warren Beatty. Apparently Elvis Presley was maybe in the mix to play Tony. Um, is that what the real problem was? Evidently, uh, uh, Natalie wanted either Robert Wagner or uh, Warren Beatty to play that role. And, um, uh, and uh, so... Uh, but it was Richard Bainer. Richard Bainer played the role. And Richard was, you know, the, the, the most difficult role in the theatre and in the film, the most difficult role in that project is, is Tony. It's, it's the hardest because you're, you're uh, alone. You have a couple of uh, big songs. It's just you. The scenes with Tony and with Maria were very important scenes, and it was really just the two of them together. And Natalie didn't speak to him. She didn't speak to him. And uh, Robert Wise, who was such a wonderful director, um, Rita has said it, and other people have said it too, that he's a wonderful director, but he's not an actor's director. But the, the, the thing that I've wondered about was, okay, Natalie wasn't speaking to Richard, and Richard was didn't know how to deal with that except to talk, doing his best at work. And But didn't anybody, didn't Robert Wise notice that Natalie was not speaking? And where was he? Why didn't he help that situation? That's just my thought, you know. Richard said in subsequent interviews, though his Tony was absolutely remarkable and there's no denying his charisma and talent, and as you say, one of the hardest roles to play. But um, he has fairly miserable memories of making that movie only because of the tensions between he and Natalie. Because he's such a lovely guy, Richard's such a lovely guy, but he did say that it couldn't occur to him under those circumstances that... He, he had a voice, he could have spoken up. It's, it's too intimidating with that kind of stuff going on to... Yes. You know, yeah. you, know. you and Natalie remained very close friends and, and obviously you had that special connection. Um, her death, 1981, a, a tragedy. How did that rock you, George? Do you remember where you were when that news came through that Natalie Wood had drowned? You know, I mean, you hear things like that. The first thing is so unbelievable that, uh, and then, you know, people still 
continue to wonder about that, about what happened to Natalie. Uh, but uh, I just, uh, what a horrible way to have your life come to an end, you know. Uh, uh, and she was so young, and and she was just, she was, she was about to do, I think, Anastasia at, at the at the music end of the play. So she was a serious actress who, who cared deeply about her career and and moving forward uh, as a as a professional, because uh, and, and to do theater, especially in in those days, uh, took took I think a, a lot of courage. You could say you were because you were taking chances to do theater. A film you can go back and do it over again. Theater can't, you know. But the, I just felt uh, with her uh, accident, uh, I just felt really, really, really sad and, and the loss of this. Now, just between you and me and the gatepost, George, this might seem a little personal. But you danced in the tightest trousers as Bernardo. Since then, uh, dancers have, uh, have discovered a material that gives and stretches with, with the movement. That my suit, funnily enough, was called shark skin. <laughs> that material was actually called shark skin. Yes. But it, it didn't stretch with the, with the movement. <laughs> so in the course of doing things over and over and over again, well, one day... One pair of, in in the back, of course, it's it's split, and it, I'm wearing a brass belt underneath. But you're, if it splits, you're behind shows. You know, you see skin. Uh, so, but there are only two pairs of those trousers. Uh, so when one pair split, I, of course, did, I put on the other pair, and eventually they, they split as well. <laughs> and so to to, to keep working. I had to put on black tights under the trousers so that you you would obviously black. You know, <laughs> we we did laugh. It was funny. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know. And you think back to West Side Story, and uh, one of the great joys, of course, is when on a movie or wherever it might be, you bond with somebody and you develop this tremendous immutable friendship. And that happened with you and the great Rita Moreno, um, who played your love in the movie. But these decades on, you two are like that, aren't you? Really very close friends. There is something about West Side Story that makes everybody love everybody else. It's it's such an, a unique experience. Um, uh, but uh, there was a wonderful girl. She was Cheetah's understudy in London. Her name was Yvonne Othon. But Yvonne and Rita and I became... We had lunch together. We did every, the three of us did everything together, so we became kind of a, a, a trio. But uh, but but we had such fun, especially in the American number, of course, because the nature of that number allowed us to play. And Bob and Jerry were uh, were very nice, letting us play and ruin and ruin a couple of takes now and again. Uh, when you do a West Side Story, there's something about the piece itself that 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 deepens everybody's caring about it. Steven Spielberg's cast says the same thing, but we we developed friendships that have lasted forever. The girls used to take Bob Wise to lunch every once in a while. And Bob said that it's the only film where the, he maintained relationships after the film because the girls made it happen and he loved it. You and Rita were so close, you went to the um, Academy Awards together. That was 1962. Bob Hope introduces Shirley Jones, who opens the envelope and out is called your name. What immediately rushed through your head? I'm not sure that anything rushed through my head. <laughs> I just knew something good had happened. Yes. Uh, I had to get out of my seat and go up on stage and uh, and say something. And I said very, very little. I just said, thank you, or something like that. You're carried by the moment uh, and you do what you know you have to do. And at the same time, it uh, it goes through you in a... In a in a, in a, in a, in a unique, unique way. Again, because you know that something, you, you've been honored in a way, you don't need to think of that word, but uh, that something 
really wonderful that's just happened to you. And I think, George, you're in the record books uh, as the person who delivered one of the shortest Oscar speeches. And in fact, I looked at it uh, just a short while ago, and it's all of six seconds. You happen to have your Academy Award right there with you. You know, one of the things about the Oscar is with, with all the different awards that we have over the course of a year, he still remains the most beautifully designed award. There's something simple, elegant, and it, it does make it because he's standing on a, 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 a reel of film and he's holding this. Anyway, it's 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 very beautifully done as a just as a piece, you know. And you go back to you winning that um, Academy Award and you were up against some pretty ferocious competition. There was Montgomery Cliff, there was Jackie Gleason, there was Peter Falk, uh, and there was George C. Scott. That's right, yes, yeah. yeah. You yeah, got the Oscar good. right there. And you also won a Golden Globe Award as well. I think I was uh, at a table with Shirley MacLaine on the night that that, that happened. Did your life change a little after that, was it all a bit of a blur? Well, it was. And and I was so naive. I, I didn't understand what the word career meant. Uh, I didn't understand the business at all either. I just, I was a dancer. And then and, and suddenly I was in the West Side Story, I was an actor. But I was lucky in so far as uh, the Mirrors Company signed me, as I say, to a picture deal. I, I don't think they always, in retrospect, uh, used me well, but I wouldn't have known that anyway. I, I I just wasn't smart enough to, as a professional in the business, to uh, to know to, to know that I was in a position suddenly to have some control over what uh, of things that happened. Did you enjoy Steven Spielberg's take on West Side Story? I I think I can be objective because I can understand uh, uh, in retrospect. Uh, the, the the change that I heard about I've, I've again I still haven't seen the, the whole film. Rita Moreno, of course, was in it, and of course they had to use her uh, uh, properly. So she sings uh, somewhere. I haven't said this till just now. It's taken me this long, uh, long to be courageous about saying this because uh, that song does not belong to that character it just doesn't and and uh I, but but i do understand why they gave it to her because if you have rita moreno you have to use her but uh that song belongs to tony and maria that's all that's how bernstein wrote it it belonged to them and through them it belongs to us yes that's right 1969, you make a movie with Lana Turner called The Big Cube. What was Lana like? Gregarious, totally unassuming, not Lana Turner, just this lovely woman. She was telling us about her funeral. Her conversation was was very honest, and uh, and uh, she was engaged uh, socially with everyone on the set, everyone on the set. They, she was, uh, it was impossible not to like her. Mm. She was nice. She really was a nice, nice person. And she, uh, consummate professional. I mean, she, she was really famous. I, I, I think I'm right in saying this, that, uh, um, you know, Frank Sinatra was famous for doing just one take and that's it, you know, uh, and she was, that proficient as well, I think is unfair sometimes about someone like Lana Turner because her career was largely based, as it was for a lot of people, on her physical appearance, on her beauty, which was really kind of staggering, you know. Uh, so her obligation, I think, to her her fans, her public, was always, she she had to look right so she didn't disappoint them. But she was also a consummate actress. A complete change of pace for you. Uh, in the 80s, you had a really juicy role in the TV super series Dallas. Remind me about your character of Nicholas. Uh, when Dallas came along, I, I was hired just one episode. 
Um, and uh, I, I appreciate, I liked it. I thought Dallas was a really good show. So uh, Barbara Carrera was the main guest uh, for that season, this beautiful Barbara Carrera. And uh, I was hired to play someone who was working with her uh, against uh, JR. Uh, uh, so I came, I did one episode and I ended up doing 11 episodes altogether. And I, I really, really enjoyed it for different reasons. First of all, I don't think there was an unhappy person, no matter what they did, everybody, it was it was a beautifully organized and well-run show. And uh, everybody was happy. There, there wasn't an, an unhappy a person on, on on that set anywhere so it was always it was a very positive uh, experience and uh, and also uh, you know it was important for for performers to 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 do television because because uh, to stay in touch with an with an audience you know uh, so there were different reasons for doing it but there were no bad reasons for doing it because it was such a wonderful show yes yes 2012 and another great accolade falls your way and that is outside Grauman's Chinese Theatre. Your footprints and your handprints are in cement. When I was taking class at the American School of Dance on Hollywood Boulevard, I, I had a, a room in a rooming house not far from there on Hollywood Boulevard and I had a scholarship at the school, so I closed the, the school, the doors every night and cleaned the mirrors and did all that stuff. And then I would walk down Hollywood by myself. It was quite, now it's packed with people, you know. But in those days, there, at that time of night, 11 o'clock at night, it was not a person around. And so I would pass Grauman's Chinese theater and have it all to myself. I mean, the chances of that happening are so rare, and and, the, and and because it did happen, it's just extraordinary to me, you know. And Grauman's Chinese, the forequarter of Grauman's Chinese theater, is a history, a partial history of 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 movie history, and and the extraordinary people who've put their uh, hand and footprints there. So the fact that we were there was just, I, it still kind of gets me. I I, I kind of believe that that happens you know and another great thrill is um when you write a book here we go uh craig here is the cover of my book which is called as you can see my west side story over 75 years in showbiz that's a lot to fit between two covers isn't it it, it is it, it was hard uh because there was a lot that I uh, I didn't remember it had to be brought to my attention. Uh, fortunately, uh, I kept a, 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 a diary, just a, an appointment book, uh, over, over quite a few years, and I I could reference them to remember where I was in a certain month or a different year. Was I in England? Was I in Japan? Where was I? And and uh, so that helped me to remember uh, quite a lot that otherwise I would have had difficulty remembering. Uh, but, the, the, you know, the great, and you know, by the way, talking to you uh, is, is uh, I, you allow me to remember again, and remembering is such a nice thing. It really is because uh, I've had such a great time. And when I, I got to admit, so many amazing people uh, and worked with some of them as well and then because uh, i i'm not uh, an aggressive person and uh so i didn't uh i didn't try to make things happen things just happened for me so i was lucky that way but uh it, it was west side that opened the door and isn't it nice that you've been blessed and you've been lucky? But not only that, at 91, you're busy because not too many years ago, you kind of went from the silver screen uh, to the um, sterling silver business. So you have a jewellery business that you're running and you're also looking to maybe do a one-man show looking back over your extraordinary showbiz life, kind of a Q&A thing with the audience involved. You know, I, I would love it. You know, that's what Cary Grant was doing up to his last day. Uh, and I, 
uh, he didn't want to be an, in front of the camera. Uh, he didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, but he he still appreciated uh, being with an audience, sharing time with people. As an actor, I, I loved acting so much. I love performing. I really did. It's very gratifying because you really you can talk to an audience, and an audience can ask you questions, and so it's an, it's an exchange, and it becomes personal and uh, on on both sides, you know. Now, George, it's interesting where one's showbiz life journey takes us, isn't it? To all of the extraordinary things you've done, you wound up right by that psychedelic bus in the Partridge family. Shirley became a pretty good friend at that time as well. I haven't seen her recently, uh, but I love Shirley. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Ryan, her youngest, I'm, I'm seeing Ryan, uh, to have lunch with Ryan in about a week or so. But in uh, back at that time when Shirley was doing Partridge Family and before, we had the same uh, represent same uh, management. So uh, I got to spend time Shirley at the house with with Jack, and so we got to know each other in a really lovely way. And and uh, you know she's just, she's great. Shirley is just and, and again one of those really honest people. Um, but uh, you know, she had a, she still has a house up at I think it's Lake Tahoe, beautiful house with a guest house across the street, and she let me use it for for a while. The and the the main house was full of like like they were living there, and I thought, well, I, I'll, I'll just go across to the guest house. It was smaller and more comfortable. But my point is, I got to know Shirley and Jack and and. Uh, uh, and I, Ryan since because he was he was a baby at the time, uh, but I I feel a real closeness surely just because of that that time that I got to spend with her and because we had the, the same representation you know I don't know there's something nice about that yeah and then you look at Jack Cassidy who was absolutely one of the greats he was such a uh, he was a he was so funny there's some wonderful funny stories about I'll tell you one I, I don't. Know, Tell me if you really have to go, but Shirley and Jack did uh, a Vegas appearance together, singing, and, and they had lots of singers with them. So it was a it was a it was a big show, and the opening act was Joan Rivers, and I was told I didn't hear it that Joan Rivers said to them, "With what this act is costing you, you must be cooking in your room." <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, my best of luck to you for uh, your one-man show. I can't wait. If you get it happening, I'll be sitting right up there at front and centre. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much.